Hello everyone and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, September 13th, 2017. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and we have got an all new season of the Weekly Space Hangout this season. Uh, we tried to had to fix a bunch of sort of difficulties in coordinating and and cat herding for last season and so to solve this problem i invited a bunch of the regulars the sort of most beloved uh commentators on the weekly space hangout to join me as co-hosts of the show so hopefully from this point on we will see most or all of this crew every week so first with uh without further ado whoever is first on the screen we've got uh Dr. Paul Matt Sutter. Yeah! Oh, come on! <laughs> I made it! <laughs> <laughs> uh, neither beloved or adored, but available. <laughs> willing to willing to <laughs> kick in on anything. Willing to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is super exciting. This is gonna be lots of fun. Uh, as well, and now people are like, oh, who, who else is it? Who else is it? Let's this see, let's be. go with uh, Morgan Renberg. Also, Dr. Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. I've always wanted to be known as a bulwark. A, bu a bulwark? <laughs> I, 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 we'll use like, that. Feels sturdy. <laughs> so, to let people know uh, where you are now. Yeah, that's right. Since I was last on the show, I have picked up and left sunny Colorado for even sunnier Texas. Uh, and I'm now the director of scientific presentation at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. There we go. Uh, and so if a person wants to come and like hang out with you in person, they go to the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History and be able to see your cool uh, exhibits. Yeah, if you're like one of the 50 or so kids uh, every day who comes banging on my door, <laughs> I may open it and glare at you. Perfect. And if so, I'll notice that you're not four years old. And that sounds like a great conversation starter to me. <laughs> and last but not least, we've got Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Good evening, everybody. And you've got a new gig as well. I do, I do. I am now working in somewhat sunny Washington, D.C. Uh, as a reporter and production assistant for EOS Magazine. It's an Earth and Space Science magazine sponsored by the American Geophysical Union. So you can read all of the stuff that I get paid to write about Earth and space science. And what is the most recent story that you worked on? The most recent story that I worked on was one that published last Friday, a whole twenty, a whole twenty-four hours after I learned that I need to needed to write it uh, about the recent string of super strong solar flares out of the sun. That's right. Yeah. I, my uh, the app on my phone has been freaking out in the last uh, week, and I've had the strongest solar flares here. As long as solar storms here that I've ever seen, like 7.6. Yeah. I, you know, I hear the auroras are something to behold. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite far nor north enough to see them, but I hear they're pretty spectacular. Yeah, the thickness of the, I mentioned this in Twitter, that the thickness of the clouds matches the strength of the storms. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. so I don't, see, I don't see anything here. But hopefully this next one coming will uh, will give me a, a shot at it. All right, so so we're going to uh, it's going to be a, again a bit of a different episode. Uh, we've got a, less stories this time around. We've also got a special guest, which I've already pre-recorded, so they're not joining us live. So at some point we will play the uh, interview with the special guest. Um, but we're going to kick into some of the stories, and I think the biggest story, of course, is that it's time to say goodbye to Cassini. Morgan, as someone who worked with Cassini, uh, what's happening? Now, this is an extremely bittersweet uh, week and the culmination of a really bittersweet few months. Uh, and that's coming from somebody who has only worked on Cassini for five years. Uh, there are a lot of scientists out there for whom Cassini represents their entire career, decades uh, of labor to send a mission to Saturn uh, that launched not quite 20 years ago uh, and spent 13 years orbiting and studying Saturn, its moons uh, and its rings. And uh, this Friday, uh, depending on where in the world you are, uh, but about 
about 5 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, uh, Cassini will plunge into the atmosphere of Saturn, uh, make its final observations, uh, and then burn up slash break up uh, and disappear into Saturn forever, where it will lock all of those nasty Earth microbes far away uh, from worlds like Enceladus uh, and Titan. Well, how do y'all feel about that? Oh, Cassini. <laughs> Uh, good riddance. No. <laughs> oh. Shame on you, Paul. Morgan, what do you think is like the number one thing that came out of Cassini? I think the number one thing that came from Cassini is a realization of Titan as almost like a living, breathing world. And I say that not meaning that there's life on Titan, uh, but there could be. Uh, but it's a world that has lakes. It's a world that has rain and atmosphere, lightning, wind blows, uh, the shoreline changes. We didn't even know 13 years ago that Titan uh, had anything on its surface at all. It could have been as barren as all the moons in, in the solar system. And instead, uh, Titan is arguably the place in the solar system that most closely resembles Earth, much more certainly than Mars, uh, more than Venus. Uh, if we were looking for a place that we could most easily build a human colony, uh, Titan would probably be it. There is no way I believe that statement. <laughs> that it would that be you could more diff it'd be more difficult to get out there than to get somewhere else, but you wouldn't need like a pressure suit because the pressure on Titan is pretty similar to the pressure you would need uh, a on the Earth. Oh, you would need a lot of jackets. <laughs> yeah, uh, you'd look like the Michelin Man for sure. <laughs> But think, you could have, like, instead of hydro-powered uh, equipment, you could have it powered by methane lakes as opposed to, you know, water power. You could do that. Yeah. Back you can't do solar the, power that far, but, you know. Back during the nuclear era, people were always worried about uh, lighting the atmosphere on fire. Uh, I That seems like a bigger concern at Titan yeah, uh, don't than it was bring ever any, a problem at Earth. Just, you just can't bring any oxygen at all. To Titan, right? right? It sounds like a great place to live, you know? Yeah, yeah. Apparently, Morgan thinks so. This is like the best idea ever. Of, <laughs> of, of, let's colonize Titan because <laughs> because that's a great plan. So you know, as Ouch. someone who so you know, as someone who's done exoplanet atmospheres as part of a thesis, I have to say Titan is my favorite part of the Cassini mission, specifically the Huygens probe, as it fell through. Titan's atmosphere and getting like full atmospheric profiles, temperature, pressure, composition at the whole atmosphere, like from the top down all the way to the ground. That's what we're trying to do with exoplanets right now. And Huygens just, you know, it, you know, fell through the atmosphere and got exactly what we're trying to do with other worlds. How far, how deep will Cassini get, do we expect, into, into the cloud tops of Saturn? Not very far. Uh, a few kilometers, perhaps a few tens of kilometers. We don't really understand uh, the density of the atmosphere that well, which is one of the things Cassini will help us uh, understand. But the radius of, of Saturn is more than 60,000 kilometers. So we're talking about uh, you know, a very small fraction of 1% uh, of the way in, but it'll be the first time ever and only the second time um, well, the first time ever we've measured uh, the atmosphere of Titan directly, or of uh, Saturn directly. And only the second time we've measured the atmosphere of a gas giant uh, directly. And so every data point here tremendously improves upon our understanding of how the outer layers of the gas giants work. For me, I mean, the spacecraft is the background of my career that, uh, you know, I started doing this work in 1999. Wait, is your career about to crash? Yeah, die? yeah, yeah, exactly. My, my career is about <laughs> yeah, to crash yeah. and die into Saturn. But I started uh, recording, like writing about space and astronomy in 1999. And, and it had already been launched two years before that and some of my first reporting was how it was going to be doing a flyby of earth and how people were a little nervous the plutonium was coming really close to the earth but there was no problem no risk it was really far away I, those are like the first cassini stories that i that i remember and then its arrival in 2004 and then all of the time that it spent gathering up all of this information and and I, we're actually working on a special video just for uh, that we're going to be posting on our YouTube channel in a couple of days and just 
dredging through the enormous amount of information, the photos, the discoveries, the new moons picked up. It's it's just it's a monumental scientific instrument and for body a whole of generation. Work. For a whole generation uh, of planetary scientists, Cassini has been uh, the outer solar system. Saturn, Saturn's been it. There are you can go back 20 years and start finding people who wrote their PhDs uh, based on the work Cassini was going to do, or was in the process of doing, or soon uh, has done. And you can find the leaders of missions like Juno and New Horizons, uh, and these upcoming asteroid missions. Uh, as people who cut their teeth on Cassini. And we don't have anything uh, coming to the outer solar system, you know, anytime soon, that's going to be anything like that. Uh, we'll have the Europa Clipper, hopefully in the next decade, but that's much more a focused mission than, than Cassini was. And I think there's real concern in the scientific community that there's going to be a gap uh, in, in the knowledge and passing that on because one day we'll want to go to Uranus uh, or Neptune, and it's the people who grew up with Cassini that'll do that. But what do they do in the next 10 years or the next 20 years? So Plato for people, how is it going to wrap up? I mean, we're recording this on the 13th, the finale is on the 15th. What's going to happen? Yeah, the last big thing that uh, Cassini has done is made its final pass by Titan. Uh, mission scientists have been calling this the goodbye kiss because uh, during this last pass, uh, Titan's gravity has changed uh, Cassini's orbit just slightly, and now crashing into Saturn is inevitable. Uh, if the mission were to stop working uh, in these final moments, uh, it would still descend directly into, um, into, into Saturn. And a few hours before uh, that impact is supposed to happen, Cassini will snap its final pictures and uh, point its radio antenna uh, forwards uh, to help shield it from the um, from the impact. And that'll it'll send back those last pictures, and then it'll basically go silent, and we'll hear nothing but a little signal uh, coming back. Uh, but even measuring how how uh, long that signal lasts will help us understand how deep Cassini was able to go before breaking apart. And by understanding how the spacecraft was put together, we can understand the forces that it would take to break it apart. And we can figure out, okay, when it reached this point, it encountered enough force or enough heat uh, to damage uh, the spacecraft irreparably. And, and that'll be Cassini's final data, data point. Hmm. And so that's that's how we're going to know how deep it made it into the atmosphere is is how long it was able to send that that faint signal back, but not using its main dish as the as the protection. That's right. I'm sad now. Oh, I, I was cracking yeah. jokes earlier, but now I'm kind of bummed. Yeah. Paul, what are you going to miss about Cassini? I'm going to miss uh, one of my favorite things about Saturn is the hexagon on the North Pole of Saturn. And Cassini, especially during these recent uh, close passes, uh, provides so many wonderful imagery. It's such a, a, a fun and interesting physics problem to explain, explain this geometric figure on Saturn. And uh, that was something that every few months or every couple of years, you'd see it pop up in the news. There'd be some new set of images, some new data collected about that hexagon, uh, that giant storm in its center. And uh, I always liked following that because it's just a fun little puzzle. That's cool. I'm putting up uh, pictures. I'm trying to put up pictures as we go here. So the, the viewers can see this, that the hexagon is a great animation of the of the hexagon. I think for me, the 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 images, and I'll try to bring these up, but there's these images of the rings that were taken by Cassini that show these wall like structures along the edges of the rings that were generated by by the moons. And it just shows that there's like this, you can see the shadows of these of these structures across the, the uh, surface of the Those are called the, the equinox images because yeah. they they were made right when the sun was perfectly parallel uh, with the rings. And images like those are uh, a testament to the longevity of Cassini because it wasn't supposed to last. Uh, even that was all the way back uh, in 2009. Uh, it wasn't supposed to last that long. And uh, it was supposed to run through the end of 2008 and then they would have crashed it in, into Saturn. But the spacecraft has performed um, so outstandingly 
that they extended the mission once and again and again, finally, uh, to take it all the way through uh, 2017, uh, when ultimately its fuel uh, is going to be exhausted and we had to had to let it go. You're absolutely right. I remember listening to some of the scientists giving sort of like the opening of the finale of Cassini, giving interviews and without fault, every single one of them started being started with something like, do you remember what technology was like 20 years ago with these giant computers and the huge phones and no cell phones and all of that? And it, it really is. The technology is 20 years old and it's still giving us, it, it's been giving us a wealth of data. Uh, it, the, and the quality is just astounding. Yeah, think about what your camera could do 20 or even really 30 years ago. Right. And then look at these last pictures from Cassini and just uh, be amazed at the level of engineering that they had to do in the 1980s and the 1990s to make sure that in 2017 we could still capture these uh, phenomenal pictures. Yeah, it only took a billion dollars, right? Oh, but it was a total more mission. than that. Can more you than put that. a price on knowledge, Paul? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. It only cost a billion. We'll look at James Webb at eight point what six now. Right. So yeah. uh, let's not think about but that. But it's cool. It's cool to think about the longevity uh, of, of these kind of missions, even though the mission's over. There's so much data and information collected by these missions that there aren't enough human beings actively in research to, to mine that data and gain new insights and to figure new things out, uh, to test theories, to run statistical analyses. There's, there's this vast reservoir produced by missions like this that will take decades to, to finally sort through. Yeah, when I was working on Cassini, uh, a lot of my uh, work was on data that had been collected a decade earlier and had been sitting around on a server somewhere and uh, either someone had looked at it once or never looked at it at all, at least in, in the way I was looking at it. And we can be confident that for the next 20 years, people will look at this same data and come to entirely new conclusions that we never thought about in the course of the actual mission. Does it feel like it's a bit, uh, I guess, the end of an era of these sort of flagship missions? We had Galileo, Cassini, uh, I guess there's Curiosity, but there isn't really anything big like this that's continuing, that's even in the works, really. Yeah, Cassini is interesting because it's actually the final uh, iteration of the Mariner program which was the first program sent to visit uh, Mercury and Venus and Mars back in the 1960s. And the original name for Cassini uh, was Mariner Mark II. Uh, and the basic Mariner design went on for Galileo, it went on for the Voyagers, it went on for Viking, and Cassini is the sort of final stop for the very first uh, design that we had for interplanetary spacecraft. Yeah. So what are, do you guys have plans? Are you going to do anything for the finale? Live stream. You're going to watch the live stream? Uh, like everyone else, I'll be tuned into NASA TV and trying to not, not be too sad. I'm going to be on a hike away from cell phone coverage for the next five days starting tomorrow. Disrespectful. Yeah. It's super just Not only that, but we're going to be publishing a, a video, like a cool kind of music video to celebrate Cassini, and I have no idea how the whole thing is going to come together. I'll find out <laughs> as my either I get a bunch of like copyright takedown requests at the end of the uh, the weekend when I get back on what, on what happened. <laughs> but... <sighs> ah, sigh. Yeah. So long, Cassini, and thanks for all the fish. All right, well, let's move on to happier news, which is that there is, and I think this is one of the most important stories that have come about within probably this year, that they found an intermediate mass black hole lurking near the Milky Way's center. Kimberly. Maybe. 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 You beat me to it. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I was going to say maybe. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert, maybe. maybe. Astronomers have discovered evidence for a possible intermediate mass black hole near the center of the Milky Way. It would make it the second largest black hole in the Milky Way, if, if it indeed exists, uh, second to our supermassive black hole at the center, of course. Uh, this one would be approximately 100,000 solar masses, uh, and it would be the first 
uh, co uh, concrete evidence of something of an interme intermediate mass black hole that we've ever seen. And I said, we there's a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, which we're pretty sure exists based on the motions of stars and gas near the center of the Milky Way. And now gravitational waves have given us evidence of more uh, stellar mass black holes of a few dozen solar masses. Uh, but the intermediate class of black holes, and perhaps, Paul, you can probably expand on this, but the intermediate mass black holes are really an, uh, a really important building block in the early in the early universe to build up these supermassive black holes that exist at, at the cores of galaxies and sort of uh, are a key building block for galaxies themselves. So at uh, this black hole, uh, intermediate mass black hole, this evidence comes from a giant molecular cloud made of carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide, very large, very cold, uh, Great relatively place speaking. Live. Great place Great to live, to, you know? Yeah. yeah. We always love that carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide. It's great to breathe. Um, but it's, it's a, a very large, dense, cold, and very black molecular cloud, which means it absorbs almost every wavelength of light. Uh, but astronomers were measuring the motions of the molecules within the cloud and noticed that, that they were going way too fast uh, for the amount of mass that they were able to observe. And so they looked further. They looked in uh, far in millimeter wavelengths with ALMA, and they looked in X-rays with XMM-Newton, pretty much the only two regions of the electromagnetic spectrum where you can see through these clouds. And notice that there was a point source in the center that was giving off a lot of radio emission, a lot of X-ray emission, uh, very similar to what we see in the center of our galaxy with the supermassive black hole. And based on the motions of these molecules, they said, aha, there has to be something very massive, but very compact right at the center of this cloud. And that would be, you know, an intermediate mass black hole right there. And now, I, Paul, you were a little skeptical. Uh, you seem skeptical, you Paul. You seem, seem skeptical, Paul. Oh, everyone's surprised that the scientist is skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> skeptical Paul is skeptical. No, but well, you're skepticals. Yeah. It's it's it, it, there's one piece of evidence, and uh, this is a very messy observation. It's a very difficult observation. My kudos to the astronomers who performed the research is not an easy thing to do. Um, and and but we just gotta see because it's just one line of evidence uh, that would lead to the conclusion that there is this massive object in near the center of our Milky Way. Uh, we'll need a little bit more to really pin down. Uh, if this is a black hole, and uh, what is the precise mass of this black hole? Right. We don't know that it, that it's actually there. We don't know it's an act, it act, it's actually a black hole. It's you know something that should be approximately a hundred thousand solar masses. There aren't a lot in a of pretty tiny that area. Hundred thousand solar masses. Exactly right. There aren't a lot of things. There are a hundred thousand solar masses that, but don't take up a lot of volume. Uh, it's black holes, and that's it. But 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 I, I mean the search in. for these for these supermass or sorry these intermediate mass black holes has been pretty difficult and I know that astronomers have been looking for them for quite a while right. and right now the lines of evidence that have shown up to show that these things have, exist is pretty weak. Uh, there's like the globular cluster forty seven Toucan A I think and they found. Uh, that the stars, the heavier stars, weren't drifting down into the middle of the cluster as quickly as you would expect, and that pulsars were being sort of jostled around inside the cluster. And I think they, they made an estimate that it was like 2,200 times the mass of the sun. That's really obscure evidence. It's yeah. tough. It's really tough, yeah. which would be... One of the reasons this is so cool is that you're right, intermediate mass black holes appear to be very, very rare in our universe. And if we turns out, if it turns out we have one in our backyard, that makes it incredibly easier to study. We can directly access it. Uh, we don't have to rely on super thin, circumspect lines of evidence from other galaxies. We can just look in the direction of Sagittarius and figure out what makes these tick. But that also introduces a conundrum because if intermediate black hole, if medium black holes are rare, 
then what are the odds that we ended up with one? They should be low. So we shouldn't generically expect a medium-sized black hole in our own galaxy just from random chance if they're rare. And if there is one there, then how common are these? And if they are common, uh, why aren't they super massive yet? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if they're the building blocks of galaxies, wouldn't you expect to see you know, a typical mass distribution curve where there would be more of the intermediate mass black holes than of the supermassive black holes? Shouldn't we be finding, like almost like now, maybe right. it's time to look inside almost every gas cloud out there and see if there's an intermediate mass black hole lurking right, there. Right, right. The challenge with that is uh, we're pretty sure that the only way to make black holes at all in our universe is through the collapse of massive stars. And this gives you a black hole, of, say, a few times more massive than the sun, up to like a couple dozen times more massive than the sun. And these can glue together to make larger ones, but that relies on chance collisions, on accumulating gas. Uh, and then we look in the centers of galaxies and we see these giant supermassive ones, but we still see evidence for supermassive black holes in the very early universe, just a few hundred million years in, like just after even during the first generation of stars, we start seeing supermassive black holes, which means these things grow very quickly. Like instantly our universe has super giant black holes. So that means the intermediate steps from small black holes to giant black holes must go very, very, very quickly in order to generate a population of supermassive black holes. And that's why there's been so much interest in dwarf galaxies and medium-sized galaxies that maybe like these galaxies, you can view them as failed galaxies, as galaxies that didn't grow all the way up. And so their central black hole didn't grow all the way up to supermassive proportions. That's why there's been so much interest. We don't expect this intermediate phase to, to last long. That was one of the things that I read is that it, they, the astronomers who d made this discovery thought that maybe this intermediate mass black hole, this medium black hole was possibly the leftovers of a dwarf galaxy that the Milky Way ate ages ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I personally want to know how it got inside the cloud. Yeah, yeah and it's still on its way. Yeah, because if there's a collision, uh, mm -hmm. then you'd expect all the gas to be stripped off. Uh, or, you know, eaten up. Or, or eaten up or flung out. There's so much dynamics happening there. So it must have yeah. ended up in some stable orbit. Maybe it's a relic of some distant collision. Uh, it's tough. It's interesting. But we see evidence of previous dwarf galaxies that the Milky Way has consumed, strewn oh, sure. about. And are there massive black holes at the hearts of dwarf galaxies? So, yeah. but the, uh, but I mean, I guess, you know, back I to, I think what research. you, yeah, um, back to what you said, though, is that the original, uh, the best evidence that we have so far is actually the gravitational waves that we see these fairly hefty black holes crashing into each other halfway across the universe. Right. So, so we do know black holes form. We do know black hole binaries form. We do know that these binaries collapse together. That's what LIGO has given us. That one piece of the puzzle, how they grow to monstrous proportions is still not fully understood. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm less excited now. You're welcome. Well, that was supposed to be a picker upper, but it wasn't. <laughs> Man. Well, you know, I, but I mean, I think that's Paul's job, right? Paul's job really is, is to just rain on, you know, ruin science fiction. Christmas. Are you the Simon like, Cowell of, of this yes, space podcast? Yes. So, uh, the, so here's, yeah. So people, we should have the audience like throw up space stories and we vote on them on whether it's a good story or a bad story or good news or bad news, and I'll play the role of Simon Cowell. But you, I don't know why you'd expect Gordon a black Ramsey. hole to do anything other than pull you down. Oh. That was uh, all on you. But but last something, year, something actually, black holes don't suck. You know, when you think about it, last year, when we were talking about people questioning dark energy and, and dark matter, you came to their defense and were skeptical of their skepticism. So I think your skepticism is it's just super meta. Mmm, meta skeptical. Yeah. I believe that's a new philosophical movement.
meta skepticism. Let's move on to the also, uh, to the to the last story that we're going to cover in this uh, first episode of the fall season, the weekly space hangout, which is uh, New Horizons is back, baby, for just a little bit. Briefly. Yeah, it, it's it's cool, and and I'll let uh, uh, Morgan and Kimberly talk more about this because uh, you, they know more about it. But I, I just happen to notice it. I'm a big fan of New Horizons. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, the results that we're learning, the mysteries we've uncovered about Pluto, and the fact that uh, there are other missions further out than New Horizons, like the Voyager probes and Pioneer probes are further out. New Horizons is the furthest active mission that we're planning on another imaging run, another data collection run to, to beam back to Earth. And the new target is MU69, yeah. a yeah. Kuiper Belt object, which might actually be an orbiting pair. We're, we're not 100% sure about that. Yeah. The it's computer crazy to me that NASA so, hasn't yeah, come yeah. up with a better name yet. I mean, how can MU69 still be the name? Why That's the this... shortened version of the name. That <laughs> yeah, is the better name. Shortened, but what's the uh, full name? 2014 MU69 something. Yeah, but like what's your option? Ask number. the internet to give it a name? Come on. Like, that's I just going to backfire. I tried that. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to go so well. Got to have something Koi P. McCoyper face. Koi P. McCoyper face. <laughs> yeah. That's, never just, ask the that's hopeless. Yeah, now, never. A lot of space missions go through these periods of going to sleep. Rosetta was asleep for years before finally waking up at uh, Churyumov Gerashmenko. And the whole idea is that by keeping the instruments off, you sort of protect them. Uh, you're not burning in the pixels on your CCD. You're not exposing your uh, detectors to dust and other interplanetary uh, particles. But every once in a while, you want to wake up, make sure everything's still working, and make some observations. Because like Paul said, very, very few spacecraft have ever gone this far from the sun in an inactive mode. So every data point that we can collect with New Horizons about life outside of Pluto is really important uh, for building this picture of how the sun's influence is changing when you get to these extreme distances uh, in the solar system. So I think it will wake, it will go to sleep soon, wake back up uh, next June, and then stay awake for its uh, New Year's Day flyby of MU69. And then? Yeah, Happy New Year. And then it's out into the great- Then it enters Voyager mode, basically. Uh, they're not gonna have enough fuel left, they don't think, to probably visit another Kuiper Belt object. Uh, it's possible one along its trajectory will be discovered in, in the next year or so, but that's pretty unlikely. And so prob probably uh, the flyby of MU69 will be its last hurrah uh, as a planetary mission, and then it'll sort of become a space weather station and map the uh, influence of the sun out to these uh, extreme distances. I can kind yeah, of imagine I'm this race against time, right? As these new telescopes are brought online, like the LSST and James Webb, and they're picking up new Kuiper Belt objects and looking for stuff that's in its ballpark, uh, maybe one of these will show up and eventually they then it could be tasked to reach that new destination or is that just like probably only thinking? if it's literally on a collision path <laughs> it's got to happen before mu69 yes if it has any chance to use its gravity to redirect it couldn't it do a nice slingshot from this, this thing flyby? Is, this thing, thing is so tiny and so so low mass there's no there's no gravity to steal essentially but if you had to pick two kuiper belt objects between the Pluto system and MU69, which really does need a better name. Uh, you couldn't have picked two more different targets. I mean, like Paul said, it may be two, two tiny objects in a contact binary, or it's a football shape, or it's a peanut shape. Something clearly catastrophic and dynamic has happened with this system. You're likely going to get a completely different object than what we see in the Pluto system. Or maybe we'll see something that'll give us a better clue towards Pluto's own peanut-shaped moons and Hydra and Kerberos and these tiny little Pluto moons that you know we still only have fuzzy pictures of. Yeah, and maybe more similar to that. I mean, we're so surprised, I, I think, as a community, uh, by what what we're what we saw in Pluto. 
of how a lot still amazed how warm it is and that was nobody expected that no one asked for that and so who knows what's out there maybe it's a prospect for colonization i mean if we're gonna go to titan we're gonna put that on the table and i want to put mu69 i want to throw that down i'm gonna throw down my bet for graffiti that says the doctor was here doctors or a monolith Mono, ooh, what if there's a pyramid there? Get the conspiracy theorists going. <laughs> it would be so horrible if there's one grainy, low contrast image that looks like a pyramid, like, you know, like the face on Mars kind of stuff. So we will never have a follow-up mission. <laughs> right. like, the high resolution, like, and it'll just be there for eternity, this, this grainy, low contrast image that looks like something recognizable. We're gonna have to put oh, James Webb on a, a bigger rocket and just coast it out to MU69 to take a look. I've uh, got a question here from Arjone, which is, uh, does New Horizons have the instruments to make similar observations of the outer solar system to Voyager, like stuff with the heliopause and such? Not really. And that was uh, a decision that was made to try to save weight and cost on New Horizons is they didn't bring instruments that were capable of measuring the magnetic field. Uh, and so that's the one observation that Voyager has basically been doing continuously for the last 40 years. And it's something that New Horizons won't be able to do. Uh, but New Horizons will have things like a particle detector uh, that it can keep active, instruments that are extremely low power. Once it flies by MU69, the cameras will be turned off forever. But some of the uh, less power intensive instruments like uh, the particle detector will be able to keep measuring and see how the distribution of dust changes as you move outwards in the solar system. Hmm. All right, well, it's time for us to move on to our interview this week. And this is going to take 22 minutes, I predict, give or take. And unfortunately, the, the rest of the team won't be able to actually see the interview. Um, you're going to have to, like, watch the video on your own computers. But make sure you're muted while I run the interview. Again, this is the first time we've ever done this. Apologies in advance. Um, we will get better. Uh, if you're wondering why we're not doing the interview live, um, one of the issues last season was getting some of the really high profile guests to be able to show up at the recording time was sort of the next level of difficulty as opposed to me making my schedule available to them and letting them record anytime they wanted. And so there was a couple of pretty high profile guests that actually kind of slipped through our fingers last season uh, because they just couldn't show up for the time that we needed to do the show. So now I offer my schedule and they can just, we can do the recording whenever they want. Now it's, I realize already a sort of bit of a mistake that I made that I put the, um, let's see if I can fix this. All right, this is clearly gonna be a problem. Uh, we'll see what happens. It's gonna be a bit of an inception moment here, but here we go. Hold on. Yeah, let's line that up. Hey, and I'm wearing a different outfit. All right, here we go. A, for our first uh, non-standard interview of the weekly space hangout is Dr. Claudia Lagos from iCard. Dr. Lagos, welcome to the weekly space hangout. Thank you, and thanks for inviting. Uh, so as I always ask people, uh, who are you and, and what do you do? Okay, so I'm a, a researcher. I'm an assistant professor at the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research in the University of Western Australia, in Australia. Uh, but I'm originally from Chile, so I've been here for, for like two to three years. Um, but I grew up in, in Chile, yeah. And what do you work on? So I work on uh, simulating galaxy formation. So uh, a bit of uh, galaxy formation and cosmology and trying to understand how uh, gravity basically set up the places where galaxies end up forming and really trying to understand how uh, we can go from this early universe that is very, very homogeneous to what we see nowadays that is a huge diversity in galaxies in, 
all the way, different ways they, they look. Now, as I understand, astronomers have had this question, this kind of burning question, which was, was the universe formed top down or bottom up, right? And with top down, you've got this gigantic cloud of gas that all comes together and forms the galaxy supercluster. And then the idea that the bottom up is you get these star sized objects coming together and then sort of growing from there. Where are we on that sort of yeah. spectrum on, on knowing which way that's going? Yeah, so uh, it, it's interesting question. I would definitely say that our best understanding favors the bottom up scenario. So what we see is that in the, in the universe, you actually start forming the smallest structure first because those are the ones that are easiest to collapse. But then these structures grow in time uh, forming the, the gigantic uh, structures that we see these days, for example, galaxy clusters. Uh, but this is not just a, a linear process. We actually see that there's a lot of complexity and a lot of complexity is driven by that 5% of matter uh, that we understand, which is you know all the atoms and uh, lights and all, all the things that we actually see in Earth. Uh, and although it's only a 5% in terms of the components in the universe, in terms of energy, it actually is chaotic enough that it can have a, a very, very strong effects on the rest of uh, that, on the rest of the dark matter itself, for example. So I could say bottom up, but with some complexity there. <laughs> so like, like a little bit of both, but mostly bottom up. Yeah, yeah. Right. And also there's a, there's a time issue. So even though the, the, the smaller things form first, because the universe is so large, you have regions that are collapsing first in the universe, but those can grow really fast. And those regions actually give rise to extremely massive galaxies very early on in the universe. And this is something that we're learning just really this year. We've seen the largest galaxies, galaxies as massive as the ones that we have nowadays, but you know, in the first billion years of the universe. So the, the question is always challenging on how you form such a big galaxy in such a short time scale uh, that you also see nowadays. And a lot of this is because the universe is so big that we get to see also the rarest objects, the rarest events, and some of these are these extremely impressive, massive galaxies, bright uh, galaxies. Right. Uh, and I know actually just uh, this week, astronomers announced that they'd found an intermediate mass black hole. I don't know if you'd, yeah. if you'd, if you'd heard that. And so it's like, that's one yeah. of those puzzle pieces yeah. that had been missing for so long. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is a big, big discovery. So obviously there's a lot to do now uh, to understand a, a little bit better how it comes, how it, well, how it lives uh, in these places, also how you survive. Because the, 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 the question here is really like, we have observed the smallest black holes. We have observed the ones that are direct remnants of supernova explosions, for example. Uh, and we have observed the ones that are in the centers of galaxies, but are you know, a thousand times, a million times more massive than the other, the other tiny ones. So if there's that missing piece in, in the middle of all the black holes that could exist uh, of large masses, for example, hundred, a thousand solar masses that we haven't observed. And there's been candidates for a long time, mostly through dynamics. So when you observe the dynamics of the stars and how the, the motions are in some systems, but uh, this is a more direct proof that, that they actually are intermediate mass black holes. So that's something we still need to to understand. Yeah. Now you come from Chile. You mentioned early on, which mm -hmm. is which is where some of the greatest telescopes in the world are are located. But in Australia, they're working on the square kilometer array, and so that's what ICAR yeah. is working on, and that's one of the tools that you're working with? Yeah, absolutely. So SKA is our flagship. It's the most important project we're involved in, not only because of the, the investment. So, you know, it's a, like a multi-billion 
investment uh, in a telescope, but also because it's really gonna revolutionize what we understand in every end, really, in the, the end of galaxy and the formation of the first galaxies, uh, all the way down to, to planets and mostly on the part of uh, organic molecules that we can, we can find in space. My interest is mostly on the galaxy formation part. So we're very excited about the prospects of measuring directly reionization and how uh, not, not just detecting it in terms of looking at the neutral gas and what the neutral gas is doing, but also looking at the, the topology of the gas. That means in detail, how is the gas being ionized in, in this epoch of reionization? And the SKA is a long-term project, so we're hoping to start mid-2020s, but we have many pathfinders. We have pathfinders in South Africa and here in Australia. So we are currently working with data from those. Um, and the, mostly the engineering group is working directly for the SKA, really working on how we're going to deal with all that data, because that's actually the biggest challenge. Right. So, you know, can you give me sort of a sense here? I mean, we're we're familiar with the capabilities of, of or we're familiar with those those radio telescopes, you know, like the ones in Arecibo or some of those big, yeah. you know, the the uh, Jodrell Bank and things like that. But can you give us a sense of, of sort of how the square kilometer array is going to compare just in terms of capability to some of those those telescopes yeah. that we're more familiar with? Yeah, so the, the, the SK is going to be a huge jump. So it's going to be two, three orders of magnitudes of uh, sensitivity. So it's actually a huge improvement, more than we've ever seen in any other uh, web and really, like optical telescope, for example, have been gone through a more uh, sustained development. So we've seen you know, improvements every time, but not of this magnitude. Um, and in terms of data, for example, the, the number that usually people in the SKA put is that you can produce in a day the amount of information that is in the internet, in the full internet today. What? So you will be producing that every in a day. day the, yeah. the, the contents of the entire internet is going to be generated by the square kilometer array. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the problem becomes that you, there's no possibility of storage. Yeah. No possibility. So the, the real challenge is that we need to analyze data on the fly and save the products. Right. Which means that we need to understand really well what we're looking for, but not, not only that, really understand how we catch things that we've never seen. <laughs> so that's really... The challenging part, right? How you go for the unknown unknowns if if you need to process the data and then only say the that process data, the products and not the raw information. Now yeah. you, you talked about a few of the things that you were sort of looking forward to. So so what kinds of things will people be able to see with the square kilometer array? You talked about sort yeah. of that, that uh, the period of reionization. Can you give sort of a little bit of more information about, about sort of what we can see today and what yeah. we'll be able to see with the SK? Yeah. So for uh, reionization, uh, nowadays, we've only really seen the effects of it on the cosmic microwave background. Um, but we've never seen it directly through imaging or even detecting the, the effect on the gas that is being ionized. So reionization, for, for those that don't know, uh, is when the, the universe goes from being mostly neutral gas to mostly ionized gas. That happened very early on in the universe, so within the first half billion years. Um, but what we're trying to do really is to directly detect that signal of the gas being ionized. The current um, radio telescope, for example, the the MWA that we have here, the Murchison uh, Array here in Western Australia, is aiming to detect the global signal of this gas being reionized. And the same is with LOFAR and other, other radio telescopes in the world. So that's what we are in. We haven't done it yet, but the current goal is to detect the global signal. The SKA 
is going to take us to a next level of actually imaging this. So not only getting a global detection of that gas being reionized, but also looking at the image and seeing how the topology of this gas was. So how it was being reionized, actually directly imaging the ionizing bubbles in the large scale structure of the universe. And that can really tell us how a reionization happened, because if you have a reionization that was mostly caused by stars being formed, or was mostly caused by the activity of black holes, leaves a very different imprint in the in the image of, of the gas. Right. So just just to kind of help people understand here, so you've got like the Big Bang, then you've got sort of for the first was 300,000, 380,000 years, everything was opaque. And then finally, the universe had cooled down enough that light could actually escape, but you still, everything was dark, so you didn't have stars, yeah. right? And that, and that reionization yeah. period is, is what? When those first, like when things started to light up again? Yeah, so it's basically when you have, oh, our understanding these days that is when you have enough star formation. So you start forming the first stars, the first stars uh, are expected to be extremely bright and produce a lot of ultraviolet photons, which are the most effective at reionizing atomic hydrogen. Um, but then the, the creation of black holes directly has also been posed as a possibility. If you have a coherent gas clouds collapsing, that can lead to the formation of a, of a a thousand or ten thousand solar mass per hole directly, um, but those would be, you know, just some beacons of light in this in this cloud of, of hydrogen. So really, what happens is that that you need enough of these to have enough radiation to reionize uh, everything, basically. So what you're seeing is is a build up of that stars being formed, possibly these black holes being formed. To the point that they are now producing enough radiation to reionize. So reionization is not like you know, one a, a snapshot in the universe in which everything got reionized. But it's a it's a process, and the duration of that process we also don't really have a good handle on. And it all depends on exactly the contributions uh, from these different sources. Now I know simulations play a pretty big part in in your work in trying to sort of run the universe with different parameters based on the simulations that you've done that have gotten us to the universe today. What do you think things unfolded like? How big were those first black holes? How did things kind of come together, do you think? Yeah, so in, in our simulations, actually, we assume that these uh, direct collapse black holes form. So we are actually kind of in the optimistic side of the, the contribution of these black holes. And even, even in that case, we find that they never produce enough radiation to support reionization. So the, the preferred explanation is still galaxies. So the formation of the first, the formation of the first galaxies providing all that, all that uh, ionization. So, uh, but, but still we are always kind of in the, in a, in a little bit of tension, because you need to form enough stars, enough galaxies to reionize the universe in that first half billion years. And we're always struggling to actually produce that. We're always trying, you know, to, to maximize the deficiencies of things, see, you know, in which situation we get all the photons that we need. And it's always in quite extreme situations. So, for example, in stars being formed too efficiently, more than we would we, we actually see in the local universe or even in the in the distant universe when the information is is good so really what this is telling us is that we might have an important tension here in the understanding of the formation of these first galaxies that we need to sort out but because we don't have that many that much information we we cannot really move forward until we we get some some good observations of this and those good observations are gonna come from SKA, but also telescopes like the JWST, the next space telescope that is gonna directly image those first galaxies and hopefully those first stars, that's the expectation. 
Right. And then we can have a full picture. So you'll be able to look at it in both wavelengths. You'll be able to look at it in visible light from James Webb and at the same time have the readings in the radio from from Square Kilometer Array and put them together to get a, better, yeah. a much better understanding of, of what was happening yeah. in, that, in that early universe. What else will the Square yes, Kilometer yes. Array let us be able to see? Yeah, so another big area of, of interest for, for us is all the area of uh, galaxy formation throughout time, really. So we're very interested in learning how the atomic hydrogen um, distributes in galaxies generally. So just to give you a sense, uh, our observations of, of neutral hydrogen are very, very limited uh, compared to the optical or the near infrared. So in the optical, for example, we have sampled several million galaxies um, with uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, with uh, 2DF and uh, several other large surveys. And in, in the, the parallel of that in neutral hydrogen is that we sample around 3,000 galaxies. Right. So there's a huge disparity there that needs to be bridged. Um, and the reason for why we need to bridge that is because gas is really telling us much more, much better than the optical light how um, the ceasing of star formation happens in galaxies. So we see galaxies come mostly into two flavors. We see galaxies being passive, being old, or we see galaxies being star forming, be, being young. Um, but we don't really understand how that, that happened and whether you can actually take one of these and transform it into the other class and, and vice versa. Uh, and the, the key for understanding that is really seeing what the gas is doing, because that's going to tell us what is causing the ceasing of star formation right. in some galaxies. And we need, in order to do that, we need much better statistics. So I've got a couple of questions that have come in from the Weekly Space Hangout crew, and they wanted to uh -huh. to ask you some questions as well. So this one comes from our instro, which is that if later reionization doesn't block all the light from the earlier universe, then why is the period of time known as the Dark Ages? So yeah, okay. Right? The, does the question make sense? Yeah, yeah. So for we call Dark Ages because we uh, expect that in some periods of time, there are no formation of stars or, or anything that can shine, basically. The only light that we see is a cosmic microwave background, but we don't see yet light from stars. So that's what we call dark ages. And you, you get the first formation of stars. So that's where dark ages stops. Right, but so dark ages is that time from when the cosmic microwave background radiation ended to when those first stars formed. But the yeah, universe exactly. was transparent during that time. Okay. Um, and this, comes, yeah. this question comes from Arjon, which is how will the LSST affect your work? Are there any questions in your line of work that could be aided by this telescope? And of course, the LSST is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Uh, do you see that coming into play with your work as well? Absolutely, yeah. With the LSST, we're, we're actually very, uh, very hopeful of all the things we can do. For example, we're pushing towards the low surface brightness universe. So there's been some very, very exciting discoveries the last two years of galaxies we didn't know about, we didn't know they existed. And, and these galaxies have very low surface brightness, but they can be quite massive. And when I, when I say low surface brightness, I mean like below the threshold of the typical service we use, for example, Sloan Digital Sky Survey again. So we didn't know they existed until two years ago but are quite massive. So the question really is how many of these are because they can completely skew our understanding of, of what we call the baryon budget. So how much normal matter there is in the universe. And the LSSD should be quite sensitive to this type of, of new galaxies, as well as any feature that is low surface brightness. So another area in which this is very interesting is that when you look around, well, yeah, in the surroundings of galaxies in low surface brightness, you typically see all the, um, the remnants of galaxy mergers. You actually see shells, you see streams that are directly related to the merging activity that galaxy had. 
So if we had more information like this, we could really understand the merging activity of galaxies and whether those mergers were what we call major mergers or mergers between galaxies of similar mass or minor mergers that are mergers between galaxies that are very different in mass, so kind of a, a small galaxy with a larger one. Um, and all that information we've done with how the LSST is really going to open that, that window for us. Right. And so far we have been opening that window with, with very small telescopes, you know, like backyard telescopes, really. Yeah. So it's going to be a huge revolution in that, in that area. And I mean, the high resolution units, yeah. It's going to be the same, yeah. And of course, you know, you'll be filling up half the internet with your data and the LSST will be taking up the other half. <laughs> And, yeah, and no one will be able to watch anything else on the internet. So I hope they like it. I hope they yeah. like astronomy. Well, uh, Doctor Legos, yeah. uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Can you let people know how to find out more? Yeah. So uh, to find more, you can go to the SKA Telescope .org. So that's the international webpage. We also have a lot of information in our institute in ecrad .org. Um. And if, and if you want to find about telescopes, I always recommend. All right, that is the end of the interview. Uh, and we've reached the end of the show. Paul, how excited are you for the Square Kilometer Array? It's complicated. <laughs> I, I, thought that was, I thought it was like a slam. It was an easy question. Like, boy, you can't wait to see the air of reionization. But no, a really powerful radio telescope that takes you right to the edge of the visible universe is kind of meh for you. It's not that. It's that the square kilometer array could have been a lot better. Uh -huh. But there were some machinations that went on during its development. And... It, for the amount of money spent, it it's not the instrument it could have been, and there may be some niggling technical issues where it's a jack of all trades but a master of none, and we end up not learning as very much about the universe. That's that's a different show. That's clearly a different. I'm intrigued now. I want to have that show soon. Uh, all right, well, I'm going to move to this mode. So now we're all four of us on the screen, and it's time to say uh, goodbye. Uh, Morgan Renberg, uh, where can people find out more? Not necessarily, you know, where can they follow you on the Twitters, et cetera? Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg, but I have to say I haven't been very active lately. I've Otherwise, you can that. check out my website, uh, morganrenberg.com, and I'll do my best to reinvigorate the Twitters uh, in the days to come. But also, you're going to be able to hear him every week here on the Weekly Space Hangout. That's right. Uh, Kimberly, where do people find out more? Well, obviously here on Weekly Space Hangout, yeah. Fraser. Of course, of uh, course. But for those who, for some reason, aren't listening, uh, I will still plug myself. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at AstroKimCartier. I just got an Instagram. <laughs> Congratulations. You so fancy. Would you like also, Astro Kim wow. Cartier. Oh, <laughs> this is my reluctant face for Instagram. For the solar eclipse, though, I did. I yep. did get an Instagram. Uh, my website, KimberlyCartier.org, and also all of my professional writings at EOS.org as well. That's fantastic. Uh, Paul M. Sutter. So do you write for the that lip balm and hand cream company? EOS? No. Yes. No. no. Okay. I'll, I'll, no. I'll keep doing that joke until someone laughs. Uh, no can, one laughs. <laughs> no one, not a single human. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook at Paul Matt Sutter. Uh, also, my website, pmsutter.com, has links to all the delicious outreach and educational activities I do, like the weekly Space Hangout, like my podcast, Ask a Space Fan, like my radio show, Space Radio, spaceradioshow.com for that website. I, I like talking about science. 
And so for for those of you who are watching this live right now, uh, thanks for joining us. We're going to be doing this every week here on the new Weekly Space Hangout channel. A big thanks as always to the WSH crew for uh, for joining us uh, live in the chat for organizing the guest and supplying a couple of the questions and it was uh, it was great to be able to to have your help with that uh for those of you who are listening uh on on the podcast version go ahead and put a rating or review in itunes that really helps us get the word out there and get more people to listen to what we're doing and the last thing that we would like from all of you is to just let us know how we can make this better so uh small tweaks. I mean, we are, you know, we've started up a new season, we've got all new technology, we've got all new methodologies, and we know that it's going to be rough. And so we'd love to hear anything that you would like us to be able to do to make the show better for you. So please uh, just go ahead. You can always just send me an email, FraserCain at gmail.com. You can post it on, uh, on the Weekly Space Hangout website, wherever you want. And we'd love to hear your feedback and any ideas on how we can make this a better show for you. we got lots of really cool guests lots of really kind of exciting stories coming up and i really hope that this will serve as one of the most sort of useful and important things that you're going to be able to use for staying on top of all of the space news every week and a big thanks to morgan kimberly and paul for agreeing to come on and share the load that means uh, i know it means a lot to the fans and it means a lot to me and it's an Absolute honor to have worked with you guys for so many years uh, and for all of the, the sort of volunteer work that you did showing up. And I know it was tough and, uh, you know, it just shows your dedication to, to the science and the communication and to the fans. And it really means a lot to me and, and I know them. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank all right. You put a ton of work into this too. You make yeah, it you all did. Well, and then I we were going to make it better. So... <laughs> So please What's the opposite let of a pity know. party? A pity a happy party? Yeah. <laughs> Birthday party. All right, everybody. Pat ourselves on the back party. <laughs> we will see you all uh, next week. Bye. <laughs>